throughout the last years, our world and society has gone through a lot. We have all noticed the last decades an increase in division within society. May it be political, as in left versus right, or vaccinated versus unvaccinated. We could go into some sort of blame game in which one side is evil and wrong, in the other moral and good. This is not the point of this video. What it is about is to understand the underlying dynamics of what is going on and what could come after. So, what we are dealing with in simple terms is the process of breaking free from the forces of unconsciousness. Throughout centuries of trauma, from the witch burnings going after those who still held a connection with the earth and held on to the old ways of the nature spirits, to mass deaths through either plagues or wars, with the crowning jewel of this collective trauma, the horrors of World War II, and finally our modern system. This collective trauma has created a state of collective detachment and disassociation from, from not just our own bodies, but from the world itself. We have been living collectively in this state for a really long time, floating in the mental realm of ideas and ideology. Around us over the last decades, more and more tools that facilitate this attachment are cropping up. From social media, certain new age spiritual beliefs about escaping to the 5D game worlds, and now the VR metaverse. This, next to the more older forms of escapism, such as alcohol or certain drugs for instance, these are signs of us, on a collective level, not being comfortable or feeling safe to be in this world. If our current times have showed me anything, it is that we are bombarded with stressors, bathed in a sea of fear and lack the structure to show us how to not only deal with stress, but how to manage it overall. A perfect example of this would be both news and social media, who are in their own way causing unnecessary stress. We don't need to be glued to the news, the world won't end if we don't constantly pay attention to the screen. This is also true of social media, endless scrolling and comparing your life with a highlight reel from other people of their happy moments will just end up stressing you out, while the only ones benefiting from it are the social media companies themselves, who are only out for ad revenue, and hence want to keep you hooked to their app or site. Don't. Let these outside sources control your life. All of this stress, the system and trauma, personal and generational, creates in us, creates the need to want to detach from our bodies and the world around us that stresses us out. We do this by consuming goods, which further fuels the system and puts more pressure on us as individuals and on the environment, while we use different coping mechanisms from, consu from consuming fast food porn, alcohol, drugs, hiding in our mental realms or escaping into virtual worlds and many more other coping mechanisms like this. These disassociative methods causing detachment from our bodies and our environment causes us to not only neglect our own health, causing a health crisis, but also through this consumerism and exponential growth based capitalism causes the destruction of our ecosystems. This consumerist capitalist system that we have can be really just be described as an embodiment of the archetype of the devourer, which is at the core of the memes that run this system. The government, news and social media are in that sense really the tools through which the memes and hence this archetype is reinforced. They are operating as an extension of the devouring father archetype, which is an archetype of unbridled rationality that eats his own children, just as Cronus did in the ancient legend. He does not actually physically eat them, as Cronus the Titan did, but by the weight of his controlling and stultifying authority, he represses their psychological growth. He prevents them from ever becoming what they could otherwise be. He devours them before they can get to the stage of challenging his authority. Control in this context doesn't, doesn't just mean telling people what to do and what not to do, when to do it and when not to do it. It means telling us how to see the world. But it isn't enough simply to say this. It's not just that we have been told how to see the world. We are told in such a way that we don't realize that we actually have been told how to see the world. We don't realize that we have been controlled at all. We think that the world just is that way. 
the government, news and social media acts as enforcers of the memes and really there's a worldview that creates the system we are living in. The pandemic is a perfect example of this. In 2020, during the pandemic, the nudge unit known as the Behavioral Insights Team and related organizations emerged as key strategic assets in the fight against the virus. Communications and policies were designed and executed with explicit awareness of the intended behavior change that organizations hope to elicit. Nudging, not education, was the explicitly stated goal of the communications teams working on public health campaigns. This was not a unique shift in strategy, as in reality, nudging became the goal of most government PR almost a decade ago. Using fear or any strong emotion to manipulate behavior strategically is a problem. This approach to behavior control will distort people's appraisals of their own emotions and distort their ability to judge what is desirable and what is not. Using emotional manipulation instead of education to control behavior is a sure sign that undue influence is being exerted. Undue influence is a legal term used to describe situations more commonly referred to as mind control or brainwashing. All of this control is done by people who themselves are super detached and traumatized by this system. You can notice this with people in government and with people such as Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk or Bill Gates, that they are not just detached from the world and their people, but from themselves. These means of control in the end are a means to get rid of their fear and to control everything because in the end they can't face the fact that the unknown exists and that there is death for the ego. But now, coming back to the nudging, because of these techniques being used and through the slow boiling of the frog, people do not notice how they are being nudged and the worldview and behavior changed and controlled. Which, like I mentioned earlier, is a hallmark of the archetype of the devouring father. The problem here then becomes that the formatted way of things is just taken for granted. We unquestionably accept it. Consciousness, we can then say, is when the formatting that the rational mind is imposing upon us becomes visible as formatting. So-called self-evident truths, in quotation marks, that everyone takes for granted, all of a sudden get shown up as being not so true after all. But to do this, it means to first embrace the archetype of the hero. The hero is also about the emergence of a well-established ego, consciousness, and breaking free from the control of unconscious or semi-conscious forces. In this case, it is about breaking free from the archetype of the devourer, which Lacronus is eating up his children, which really represents him swallowing up consciousness, so it can never rise against him. So then our first step becomes to question what we believe and why we believe it and to start questioning what one hears from sources around oneself. Then comes the archetype of the seeker. The seeker archetype compels the search to find oneself. Seekers are explorers of the soul. They are always on the lookout for something that will raise consciousness, whether in the realm of the spiritual, medical or psychological. The seeker archetype itself Next to truth and wisdom is about autonomy and independence. This is why it is of importance to those who are going down the road into the abyss of the unconsciousness. And as a balance to those who would otherwise become too passive and compliant to others and society at large. As a psychological archetype, the seeker is a personification of the independent spirit. It represents one's autonomy and ability to pursue a life of your own choosing. To do this, we also need to focus on embracing our inner warrior. The warrior has mastered himself in body and mind. His power is rooted in self-control. He's the master of his energies, releasing them and pulling them back as he chooses. He decides the attitude he will take in a certain situation instead of letting the situation dictate how he feels. Unlike the boyhood hero archetype, the warrior understands his limits. He takes calculated instead of unnecessary risks. The warrior is the archetype of destruction. However, the warrior in his fullness only destroys in order to make room for something new and fresh and more alive. His is an act of creative destruction. He doesn't tear things down simply for the pleasure of doing so. We call upon the warrior archetype when we, for instance, want to quit bad habits and replace them with better ones. 
Then finally, the archetype of the king is needed, which is about embracing confidence, purpose and well-being to give one a sense of balance. When it comes to this archetype, it is about having firm principles. So when a crisis comes, one does not waver because one has already determined the course one will take in about setting boundaries for one's own psyche. We see this archetype manifest itself in us when we establish rules, guidelines and principles to provide the structure that allows ourselves and other people to flourish. This archetype is also about living as a sovereign being by one's own edicts, to embody who one deep down truly is and to embody what one truly believes in and to stand one's ground, which is in the end what we need to strive for if we want to live in a world which is free and in which we are no longer controlled and manipulated by the archetype of the devourer into giving it our life force, consciousness and freedom. From the very beginning, a greater sense of separation from nature began with the emergence of agriculture and has been accelerating to the present day. This created detachment regarding our own bodies and detachment of us from nature and the ecosystems we live in. We have now reached the pinnacle of this detachment and disassociation. Now it is time to return to our bodies and to the world, which also means a dramatic shift in our worldview, from one of separation and detachment to one where we feel that we humans, the rivers, forests and creatures of the natural and material world are sacred, or at least valuable in their own right. Then our response might be more wholesome and ultimately effective. We now live in times of transition, from the astrological age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. Jesus, who is the archetype of the self, returns as archetype of the king, which is a symbol of not only our own sovereignty, but a symbol of working our way to embodying all of who we are, to stand as sovereign individuals in our truth. When it comes to the Christian story, it ends with the creation of what they call New Earth. The revelation concludes with a final vision of the marriage of heaven and earth. God announces that he's come to live with humanity forever and that he's making all things new. This is a story of rebirth. In John's symbolic vision of this great rebirth, he saw a new heaven and earth, a clear reference to the very beginning of the biblical narrative. Revelation 22 then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. However, in John's account of a garden, humanity wasn't represented by a couple. John describes seeing all the nations there working to cultivate the garden as Adam and Eve did in Genesis. For John, the fulfillment of God's purpose through Jesus would result in the restoration of humans to their place as co-rulers of God's world. And in the most surprising twist of all, there is no temple building in the new creation. The presence of God and the Lamb that was once limited to the temple now permeate every square inch of the new world. And for Paul... The end goal is not disembodied bliss in heaven, but rather a restored physical existence, which is a gift from heaven. This means, in a sense of the king archetype, to embrace our fullness of being, to restore not only our sovereignty, but to restore the sovereignty and sacredness of our planet and Mother Earth and all the beings that live within and on her. And this requires a more radical approach, Namely, to create an alternative structure of the people, by the people, for the people. One which respects not only our freedom of the mind, but also one which is aligned with our environment and the ecosystems of our world. Which creates a better world, if not for ourselves, for those who come after us. The world we want to live in is created by the worldview and memes we hold. Now is the time to consciously choose for the better world we know in our hearts is possible. It is for us to embrace our role as guardians of this world, as the world's gardeners. It doesn't mean, however, to create a literal garden of the earth, but about restoring our ecosystems and to restore the ancient food forests that were lost. Not just the Native Americans, but also other peoples used to plant and cultivate these food forests, creating a natural abundance for not just us, but for all living beings. 
This process of creation is a process of every person doing a small part of the whole. You can start by planting a tree, come together with like-minded people in your local community and help each other become independent from the system. Create self-sufficiency and abundance where the system creates dependence and an idea of scarcity. Don't wait on the government or others to fix things. Start doing something, however small you think it is, and with others, add on from there. We ourselves can change the world that way, without needing any authority figure to do anything or any savior to come in. We need to embody what Jesus, or as archetypal king here, represents. What I've learned myself from digging into the myths and the Greek concept of the Kiklos is that many people have endeavored to stop it, this cycle, similar to Odin himself in myth. But it is not something that can be prevented, it seems. Only reconnecting to the self and to what is life-affirming will make sure you survive it. It is necessary for the old Pisces age to die, for there to be a new Aquarius age. So all the old structures will die with it. Those in power currently will cling onto it desperately, while those who want to destroy the structure are closing in. While they go ahead and have their fight that leads to nothing, I have found it more worthwhile to focus on building new structures and new ideals for myself that are connected to something which is life-affirming instead of subscribing to what either side is saying in their detached, jargonite battle. It is, I think, personally, better to make new structures that support there to be life, may it be through seeding ecosystems again, where some bring destruction to it, or act within communities that are supportive, instead of social media that feeds of fear and trauma. Really what I see the actual future to be is to reconnect with nature again, and with the self, and what is life-affirming, to build our own life-affirming structures, separate of the structures of the Piscean Age. This means to grow food, rebuild a supportive ecosystem for all animals, and create in the Christian sense the garden. So while the Jargonites battle in their detached metaverse inside of a supercomputer, we bring life and growth where there was death and destruction, and we bring healing and embodiment where there was trauma and detachment. I would like to end this video by quoting a part of Tao Te Ching, chapter 63. See simplicity in the complicated. Achieve greatness in the little things. In the universe, the difficult things are done as if they are easy. In the universe, great acts are made up of small deeds. The sage does not attempt anything very big and thus achieves greatness.